Hello. Thank you to the Australian Citizen Science Association for this opportunity to talk about the real gap in citizen science. And I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, original custodians of this land, the Turrbal and Jagera peoples. So the real gap in citizen science, recording what eats what and what uses what, and we need to think about what needs to be done, how and why. We need to be recording ecological relationships information. To do so, we need to have a publicly accessible platform for recording this information and a means of encouraging people to record the information also. And all of this because invertebrates play a critical role to the health of life on Earth and very, very little data has been captured to about these um, species and their relationships. So what eats what, what uses what, how, when, where and why, and then how does a predator find the pr its prey and how does a herbivore find its food plants? Every living thing needs food to metabolise, provide it with energy and nutrients to grow and to ensure that it remains alive to reproduce the next generation and complete its life cycle. Every form of life has evolved in a community of other organisms interacting to a varying extent with different species, finding and creating niches within that community and developing into new species over a long period of time. No species are directly interchangeable. Every species has evolved with its very own role to play, whether we like that role or not. Each species is in a in a community is playing a some role in regulating something about the behaviour or, or the population size or the biomass or, or whatever of the other species it's interacting with. It's doing this either directly by eating particular species or in some other ways such as providing shelter and or a defence mechanism amongst other things. We need to understand this much better. Increasingly, citizen science is being regarded as a useful, complementary and bona fide source of research and management data that is being used by research academics, but also for conservation planning and management, for developing government policy regarding natural and agricultural systems, for supporting people's funding applications and by a growing number of individuals that are increasingly interested and curious about living things. The ecological relationships data is important for forming a holistic view of the impact species have on each other compared with a focus on single species taken out of their ecological context. I hope to say more about this later. Aside from the data on what eats what and what uses what, there's a further question for future ecosystems recovery. How do the things <coughs> that eat each other find the things they eat? This last question is all the more especially important for those insects and other creatures that can't simply fly around or take big strides to locate, to readily locate their food sources. So some background to what I'm saying <coughs> that might be useful. Um, my garden has been a source of inspiration and also a source for writing and publishing two books, giving talks, leading walks, all of which are linked to my topic today. In 1983, I gained my first conscious inkling about what it's what and its associated ecological questions and that they were interesting and useful. At that time, I was shown a list of well, what it's what host plants for butterfly caterpillars. This offered a practical direct experience way with plants and the specialist and generalist insects and other animals that eat them along with the ecologist noticing the ecological flow on effects as they play out everywhere since that time i've raised 75 approximately but species of butterflies and some moth caterpillars and also a variety of other insects and invertebrates this is based on planting a diversity of 90 different non-host plants over time on a 405 square metre property in West End, Brisbane since 1988. Growing the specific non-host plants for caterpillars and finding new host plants occasionally resulted in observing how their plantings attracted a wide range of species, simply, wider range simply than the target species. 
they often included other Lepidoptera species that eat the same plants, along with insects from other orders such as true bugs, all of which brought in with them the predators and their predators and parasitoids, and such as spiders and a wide variety of wasps and different types of tachnid fly. In 2005, I began working on what is the what is what question and how to record the information. It quickly became apparent that um, developing any database at the time with anything like the scope of, of to answer the ecological questions that needed to be answered required institutional support. Um, for long-term security and um, resourcing. Public, publicly accessible relational database technology and its ability to be utilised via the internet was changing very rapidly and probably still is. And this can be seen by the great num uh, the great apps that have been developed and have then languished for ongoing from lack of ongoing support. Unfortunately, soon after this original foray into the field, my um, personal circumstances changed, though I've recently started following it up again. So, to date, citizen science data has been largely limited to the species that are noticed, photographed, perhaps sampled, along with the location it's found at, and then some other notes. Great, a naturalist is a great source of this useful information. And naturally, it's way simpler to deal with an individual life form, such as the pick of a blue warts caterpillar that I raised, not sure who named it that, um, to find that it was the larva of a cup moth called Calciferia, probably said it differently, uh, ordinata. Previously, this, this, the caterpillar for this moth was a different, that had been assigned to it, was a different caterpillar. <clears throat> I had great fun with a pic taken by um, Diane Guthrie recently with lots of happening on it. Possibly cagey did eggs, a galling insect, some herbivorous invertebrate that had either scraped or mined the leaf some time ago, and some webbing, perhaps a caterpillar, maybe a spider, perhaps spider mites. With, though which ones? Who knows what was interacting with what in that picture? though they were all clearly interacting with the um, eucalypt leaf. Also, the question arises, is each a generalist or a specialist or somewhere in between? Many sources of information can be found in published literature for the research that has been done, um, as journal articles and scientific texts. Unfortunately, these aren't readily accessible to the public. It may become possible for machine learning to harvest some of this in the future and contribute to searchable databases. There are a small private databases being compiled by really dedicated people where relationships data is being collected. However, these are currently unable to make the major contribution that it is possible for them to make. This is largely due to issues of where and how to house the information how to maintain the records in formats able to be used into the future as technology changes, and also a range of other technical issues. There's also the how to promote the resources to pro and resource the work. I'd love to acknowledge anyone who is currently or has or is currently doing this work. To frame it up, insects, arthropods and the larger invertebrate world is a complex part of ecological ecosystems and their interactions. For example, it's estimated that 31% of all named insects that are, speciali are specialised to the plants that they actually eat. The specific host plant information is only well known for a small subset of herbivorous insects, basically Lepidoptera caterpillars, especially butterflies, a few moths and, and a limited number of others. Other insects, and arthropods and invertebrate, invertebrate and vertebrate species at higher trophic levels are dependent on this high proportion of specialised insect herbivores. There is little information about <clears throat> which species are specialised at any trophic level. Much information is needed to truly understand and protect invertebrates and the higher life, life forms that are so dependent on healthy insect and other invertebrate ecosystem components. 
For example, nearly all terrestrial Australian birds are understood to feed their nestlings insects, irrespective of what they eat as adults. That's according to Daryl Jones. And then the question arises, just how specialised or generalised is each bird species in relation to the type of insects they feed their nestlings? But to move on to a, um, on to a case study, Alphatonia excelsa. I started working on this in the early 1990s uh, because it was the host plant for the small green banded blue. So, um, and so I started raising it and um, exploring its life cycle. And then I'll rush through these. And then I started seeing that the plant was already heavily eaten in lots of cases, though really being able to see the insects that are eating them. So on this next slide, there are evidence of two different types of um, leaf, eat, well, three different types of leaf eating. One is um, scraping from the back. That's been done, these tracks have been done by um, um, the small green banded blue. The other slide has the insect has scraped the surface or animal has scraped the surface and then on the right hand side um, something has chewed it from the side. So um, so then I started photographing all the insects that I could find that were using it. I raised um, the caterpillars of the Caspia rectaria, um, got it to pupate, and um, the, the little butterfly, the little moth, it closed from that. Uh, then I was searching publications and internet um, um, resources. I found these three other insects that are known to use um, the um, Alphatonia excelsa. I then further noticed that often um, bits of Alphatonia just die off really suddenly, and that's the um, work of a longicorn beetle that ring barks the stems of the plant and lays her eggs above the ring bark. This slide also has some um, bramble um, sawfly larvae uh, that chew it and um, a galling insect that I haven't had ID'd yet. From there I noticed that um, quite often you'll find split-footed uh, lacewing larvae on, um, on Alphatonia excelsa and here it's caught what I think is a Caspia rectaria looper caterpillar um, that I, I know is a host. But um, the other interesting thing about it is um, all the hemiparasitism, mistletoes. There are eight species of mistletoes that are listed as being that supported by Alphatonia excelsa. I've just here I've just picked the first one, Amyema congena, um, because I've raised the um, black Jezebel life cycle. So each of these eight species will have its own constellation of insects and invertebrates with some overlap that they support. So like it just starts mushrooming out of all proportion from here as far as I can see. So just to move on to another species that I've done a bit of work on, Corzinus formerly Caratia clematidia. Um, I've raised the life cycle of the, um, the uh, Joseph's coat moth several times, occasionally the Crururia donawana life cycle and um, the list of hawk moths um, records 11 species of hawk moth larvae that use this particular plant species. So it's pretty amazing um, host plant. So, um, oh. so to close, the main option for actually recording life cycle information is to record it and cross-reference it on um, on iNaturalist. Today's presentation is a call to arms about developing a comprehensive a slide set, a, sorry, comprehensive database of, um, 
of host plants. Please contact me if you'd like to pursue this discussion any further. Thank you.